So our class today is on mitochondrial ion transport. And I'm going to start this first video by talking about some general properties of ion transport, how these properties can be slightly different in mitochondria, the specifics of mitochondrial ion transport, and then talking about ionophores and how we use them in mitochondria to understand some specific properties of mitochondrial ion transport. So specifically, when you have ion transport in any membrane, you need a pathway for this ion transport to happen, and you also need a driving force for this transport to happen. And specifically in the mitochondrial inner membrane, the driving force tends to be the mitochondrial inner membrane potential, which really attracts species with positive charges into the mitochondrial matrix. Another characteristic of ion transport in general is that there are different types of transport. First of all, you can characterize this transport as transport happening through the bilayer of lipids themselves, the bilayer of phospholipids themselves. This can either happen because whatever is being transported is naturally permeable to this bilayer. Typically, that's not the case with ions because they have charges and therefore they're not permeable to this bilayer. Uh, this can also happen when you add some kind of a substance that masks the charge or the polarity of whatever you're transporting, like an ionophore, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and this mediates this transport also through the lipid bilayer. And also you have transport through proteins, and that's where really we're going to talk a lot about today in the class, protein-mediated transport through the inner mitochondrial membrane. Another characteristic is that transport can be passive, simply allowing the substance to be transported across the membrane without concentrating it in any manner. Or it can be coupled to metabolism and therefore being active transport. Now typically in other organelles you'll see transport coupled to metabolism in ATPase, such as the calcium ATPase in the ER. In mitochondria, ATPases don't happen because mitochondria have the inner membrane potential, and that can be the driving force for transport into the membrane. We don't call that direct coupling to metabolism, but that is a form of secondary coupling to metabolism when an ion is transported down the proton gradient. Another characteristic of general transport across membranes is that this transport can happen as a uniport, or one specific species is being transported. It can happen as a symport in which two species are being transported in the same direction, or it can happen as an antiport in which one species is exchanged for another species, and the transport of A is coupled to the transport of B. You have uptake of A in exchange for release of B. Another characteristic of transport is that it can be electroneutral, either when whatever you're transporting doesn't have charge, or when you have an exchange of a substance for another substance with exactly the same charge, so there's no net charge change. Or it can be an electrogenic uh, transport in which you have a change in the charge across the two sides of the membrane. So you have transport of a charged species, or you have transport of two species with different charges, so you have a net change of charge. So those are general characteristics of ion transport. Let's talk about now a few specific things about mitochondrial bilayer-mediated transport that are important to remember when we're talking about mitochondrial ionic transport. First of all, mitochondrial membranes are different from most membranes of the cell because they are very protein-rich, as we saw in the first class in this series. So you actually have at least as much protein as you have lipid in these membranes. Therefore, bilayer-mediated transport happens in a smaller portion of this membrane because it's a very protein-rich membrane. And this is something that you have to take into consideration when you're thinking of mitochondrial ionic transport. Another characteristic is that these very abundant proteins in the mitochondrial inner membrane are not bound to the cytoskeleton, so they could be more mobile than proteins in the plasma membrane, for example. However, there are constraints to the transport of these proteins, some of them like the respiratory complexes because of their size, and some of them because their location 
determines and is determined by different kinds of structures in the membrane, such as we saw uh, the ATP synthases tend to be in folds in the inner mitochondrial membrane on the tips of the crystal, for example. So they, they are not linked to the cytoskeleton, which could confer more transportability. Um, on the other hand, there are these characteristics of their structure that maintain them more in the same place without a cytoskeleton. Uh, another characteristic of the mitochondrial inner membrane is that it has a different lipid composition from most other membranes in the cell. Specifically, as we saw, it contains cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is a different lipid because it has four acyl chains. And also, the mitochondrial inner membrane is not symmetrical. So you're going to have a lot more cardiolipin typically on the inner leaflet of the inner mitochondrial membrane than on the outer leaflet of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that means that this membrane is quite different from an artificial membrane that you might use to study channels in vitro. And you have to consider that when you're thinking of the function of these proteins within mitochondria. Their function may actually change a lot if you reconstitute them in artificial membranes because of these specific characteristics of the natural inner mitochondrial membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane is considered permeable to most substances in the cell that don't have polarity. Uh, so it's considered typically permeable to oxygen, to carbon dioxide. That's very important because mitochondria take up oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. Uh, it's considered permeable also to hydrogen peroxide, although hydrogen peroxide has also been shown to be transported through aquaporins, which are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. On the other hand, anything that's polar or has a charge will tend not to be transported through the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the reason for that is that the energy barrier for this charged or polar species to transverse a membrane is very high. So the chances are that this substance is not going to achieve this energy necessary to go through the membrane. An exception is with things that are very, very abundant within the cell. So an exception can be made for protons because they're very abundant in the cell, for potassium, which is the most abundant cation within the cell, and also possibly for water because it's so abundant in the cell. Although water may also be transported into mitochondria through aquaporins, which have been located in mitochondria. Basically, although they're polar or charged, these three components are just so concentrated that the chances are that some of them might achieve the energy level necessary to be transported through this membrane and go to the other side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we can talk about proton leaks, we can talk about potassium leaks, and we know that mitochondria can take up water even with an intact inner membrane. Now for other substances that aren't permeable to the inner mitochondrial membrane naturally, you can increase the permeability of these charged or polar uh, substances by adding artificial molecules, which are ionophores. So ionophores are basically molecules that have a lipophilic characteristic on the outside, therefore they can interact well with the membrane, but on the inside can interact well with a specific ion or maybe a group of ions, and therefore transport these ions within them and decrease this energy barrier for the transport of an ion across a membrane. An important thing about an ionophore that you have to remember is that it works just because it's lipophilic on the outside. And therefore, it's going to transport your ion within any kind of membrane. So ionophores are not specific to the mitochondrial membrane. And I'm saying that because it's not uncommon to see studies that forget that when they're looking at intact cells, for example, and treating these cells with a proton ionophore. Obviously, that's going to decrease the mitochondrial proton potential, and this is going to lead to mitochondrial uncoupling. But people sometimes forget that this is also going to affect the plasma membrane and its proton gradient, so also affecting different membranes within the cell. You always have to remember that ionophores are going to affect all membranes within the cell. Another characteristic of ionophores is that they concentrate specifically in the lipid parts of the cell, and therefore their concentrations 
and these lipophilic environments are going to be very high. Because of that, you really have to be careful with the quantities of ionophores that you use. You may very easily have toxic effects of these ionophores on membrane proteins, for example, just because their concentration in the membrane is so high. That's why whenever you're working with an ionophore, I really recommend titration and using the lowest possible concentrations of these ionophores so you have the more specific ionophoric effect and not an effect that's toxicity because of the accumulation of this molecule within the membranes. So here I just want to show you a few examples of how you can use ionophores to increase the transport of ions across a membrane in general, and we're going to talk a lot about across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, so an example is valinomycin. Valinomycin is a potassium ionophore, which basically can bind selectively to potassium and can transport this potassium by masking uh, its positive charge in its interior across membranes in general. So it can get potassium from the outer uh, side of the inner mitochondrial membrane and transport this potassium into the mitochondrial matrix. The same molecule can also cross the membrane when unbound to potassium, pick up another potassium and continue this cycle. Uh, ionophores such as valinomycin can cycle potassium, but their speed is not super high because they have to circulate around the membrane. Uh, they tend, though, to be quite specific for the ion that they bind to. So valinomycin will have about 10,000 times more affinity for potassium than it does for sodium, which it also binds. And this selectivity is quite useful when you want to specifically transport potassium. When you're talking about channel forming or pore forming compounds, uh, the selectivity is much lower. So this is grimacidin, it's just an example of a channel forming compound. It's able to transport cations also, but with much less selectivity. So it won't select potassium over sodium uh, with the specificity that we saw for valinomycin. The advantage of these kind of transporters is that the speed in which they transport is much, much faster. But because of lower selectivity, we use less of these kinds of ionophores. Nitroricin is an interesting example of ionophore because when it binds potassium, it must lose a proton. And when it loses potassium, it again binds a proton. And it actually transverses the membrane when either bound to potassium or bound to a proton. And the result of this is that it acts as a potassium proton exchanger. It allows, for example, entry of potassium and release of a proton in a coordinated manner. So it's a potassium proton exchanger, and that can be useful. And you can actually um, look at transport by nigericin and valinomycin and compare to see if the transport that you're studying physiologically is just a uniport or if it's an antiport, um, because valinomycin acts similarly to a uniporter and nigericin acts similarly to an antiport. Now, a group of ionophores we use a lot in mitochondria are proton ionophores. Perhaps the most used uh, nowadays is FCCP. These are large lipophilic molecules that can be protonated reversibly. And when protonated or not, the difference in charge is kind of lost in the total lipophilicity of this molecule. So the molecule can actually cross the membrane both with and without a proton, even though it does have a negative charge without the proton. This leads to a short circuit in the proton circuitry, as we saw in the last class, and basically uncouples ATP synthesis from the electron transport chain, increasing electron transport and decreasing ATP synthesis. We use these molecules a lot to understand properties of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Um, now, mitochondrial ionophores, uh, protonophores specifically, have been known for a long time. Actually, they were known to affect mitochondrial function before we understood how mitochondria synthesized ATP, before Peter Mitchell proposed the chemiosmotic theory. In the early 1900s, dinitrophenol, which is also a proton ionophore, was known to decrease body weight in workers and in industries that had dinitrophenol uh, as part of their industrial production. Uh, because of that, dinitrophenol started to be used as a diet weight loss product uh, 
in the early 1900s, but was soon found to be quite toxic when used in larger concentrations. Uh, that led to the creation of the American FDA as we know it today, uh, as an agency that controls the use of substances uh, such as drugs by people, and the use of dinitrophenol has been banned since then. But this was important information for Peter Mitchell to actually understand the proton circuit and how that was related to ATP synthesis. Because of this effect of dinitrophenol, he actually used this effect when he constructed the chemiosmotic hypothesis. So proton ionophores are really important in terms of our understanding of mitochondria. So that's what I want to tell you in this first video. I'm going to come back in a second video and start talking about protein-mediated ion transport. So bye.